Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Non-Traditional Mergers. Are they a short-term trend or a phenomena that's going to be around for a while? That's a question we hope to have an answer for you by the end of the hour. First off, I'd like to offer our apologies. We had a few technical difficulties, but now it seems we're all ready to go. So hopefully we'll have a, a very informative hour and presentation, and hopefully I'll get to many of your questions at the end of the hour. Today's subject matter on non-traditional mergers is a bit of a change from what many of you are probably accustomed to for a CPE session. But as you'll see during the presentation, the accounting profession as a whole is evolving with new workforce demographics, constantly changing regulations, and perhaps most of all, the wave of pending technologies that promise to disrupt how traditional CPA firms operate in the future and the effect that these technologies will have on commoditized client services. And also, of course, how well these f firms can adapt to these changes in the near future. As a result, CPA firms are not just looking to merge with traditional accounting practices as a growth strategy, but rather outside the box, so to speak, for companies specializing in higher-end advisory services that will not only help meet client demand, but boost their competitive points of difference as well. Firms are now looking toward non-traditional companies, such as those offering cybersecurity, medical and HR consulting, payroll, marketing, and engineering. A bit later in the session, we'll look at some examples of some recent acquisitions of such companies, as well as examine the different ways of structuring a non-traditional merger deal. But as, as always, before we begin, there's a few housekeeping items that we're required to go over. For NASBA and CPA Earned Credit Guidelines, Transition Advisors is a sponsor on the National Registry of CPA Sponsors per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, or NASBA. In order to receive your 1.2 CPE credits for this afternoon's presentation, you must complete two requirements. You must participate in all four of the polling questions during the presentation. Note, a partial credit will be given for those completing three polling questions. However, you must complete at least three to get partial credit. No partial credit will be given for two, question, for two polling questions or less. Also, complete the online evaluation, which will, be eva which will be available after today's webinar. The attendee control panel. Take a moment before we begin to familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right hand, of your the right hand side of your screen. The orange arrow on the top of the control panel is to minimize the control panel. All participants this afternoon will be muted during the presentation but you can communicate with the organizer or myself using the question box toward the bottom of your control panel. All you need to do is just type in a question and then click send. I'll try to answer all of your questions during the presentation and we certainly welcome your participation. You're welcome to send in a question anytime. You do not have to wait till the end. Should I not get to your question uh, because of time limitations, my contact information will be available on the final slide of this presentation, and feel free to contact me there, and I'll be happy to discuss whatever uh, question you have in mind. Just a look, uh, a preview of some upcoming webinars. Uh, July 24th, we'll be featuring Seven Steps to clo Closing a Merger. That's in conjunction uh, with CPA leadership. The following day on July 25th, We'll be offering how to self-assess your firm's readiness for merger, acquisition, or sale, and that's also with CPA leadership. Uh, the following month, on August 21st, we'll be looking at case studies in how to admit new partners. And on September 25th, we'll look at trends in the marketplace for CPA firm mergers and acquisitions, and that's also done in conjunction with CPA leadership. For further uh, Upcoming webinars, we welcome you to uh, to look at our our website, transitionadvisors.com, which will give you all the information not only for uh, upcoming webinars, but also some articles and resources as well. That's a few a few words about our company for those of you who may not be familiar. We're a full service consulting firm, and we work exclusively with CPA firms on issues related to ownership transition and succession. We specialize in such things as transaction support, practice valuations, 
transition planning, succession planning, uh, designing comp plans, drafting partner agreements, uh, introductions, negotiations, and of course, deal facilitation. And we come to our first polling question of the afternoon. Uh, we'd like to always get a demographic of our audience today. And the first question is, how many equity partners do you have in your firm? And as you can see, there's five choices. One, two to four, five to nine, 10 to 19, or 20 plus. I'll ask our organizer to open up the polls for everyone. And we'll keep it open for a few seconds, let everyone weigh in. And just a few more seconds, give everyone a chance. Okay, I think everyone's had a chance to weigh in on that. Could I ask the organizer to close the polls? Okay, and show the audience, share the poll results with our audience. So you can take a look and see who's listening along with you today, this afternoon. Okay, as I, as I, uh, I'll remind everyone, you have to answer at least three for partial credit and all four this afternoon for full credit. A look at today's agenda. Uh, we'll look at uh, the profession by the numbers, merger mania, how long is it going to continue? And as I, as I said at the outset, and of course the subject matter, we're going to look at non-traditional mergers. Everyone knows that uh, merger, there's a, a continuing merger frenzy in the accounting profession, probably over 700 uh, traditional mergers over the past couple of years. And today we're going to look at the non-traditional merger and I think some of the statistics will um, will sort of surprise you. We're going to look at the new accounting firm, the accounting firm of the 21st century. We're going to look at, at, at as far as non-traditional unions. We're going to decide are they right for you, and they may not they may not necessarily be, but that's a decision you're going to have to make. And hopefully, the information we'll give you this afternoon will help you make an informed decision. And methods of affiliation, how to and how to value a non-traditional partner. Whether you're buying the entity outright, are you going to make the? Are you going to merge it in? Is it going to be a joint venture? Are you going to set up a separate entity? That sort of thing. We'll look at some of those down the line. So hopefully, uh, at the end of the hour, you'll have a, a fairly good grasp of what's going on, and perhaps something. Uh, this is a growth strategy that you would like to pursue. Like I always tell our audience, if there are 50 things you need to think about in a transaction, the smartest of us will only think of 35. And as my dad used to tell me when I was a youngster, if you're the smartest person in the room, get out because you're in the wrong room. Again, uh, like I, I mentioned at most of my presentations, I teach quite a bit of CPE during the year. Uh, you can't run a CPA firm in 2018 like you did in 1980. Uh, there are just too many factors that have changed, not only technology, but workforce demographics, um, client services, the client itself, they're more informed. Let's, but let's look at just some of the changes that have occurred in those past years. Value pricing and value billing. I don't think there's a, an, uh, an issue of the accounting press or some of the journals from the accounting associations that don't, don't uh, tackle the uh, value pricing, smart pricing, value billing. So for about uh, the about 20, 15 to 20 percent of CPA firms across the country now use some form of value pricing or value billing. Firms moving to a one partner, one firm concept sort of eliminates the book of business silo, the my client, your client turf war, rather than the individual books of business. Especially among, uh, we see this especially among partner loyal firms versus brand loyal. And I, we, what I mean by that, it, as far as an explanation, partner loyal firms are usually uh, smaller firms, not necessarily sole practitioners, but not the regional or super regional firms where their clients are brand loyal. Or people would be brand loyal to a KPMG or to an Ernst & Young, where they may not be intimately familiar with the partner on their engagement. So the partner loyal firms, local firms, maybe those up to 10, 20 million, <laughs> something like that, pardon me. So that's what I that's a distinction. Working remotely. Now this is interesting. In 1995, there were 9.5 million remote workers. That number 
<laughs> excuse me again, uh, in 2012 jumped to 13 and a half million. And now roughly 40 million people work remotely at least once a week. By the end of 2018, according, according to Gartner Research, that's projected to reach about 75 million. 75 million people will work remotely at least one day a week. And because of the cloud, and you'll see or the next bullet point, greater use of mobile devices, more than 95% of CPAs, and the, probably a little bit higher percentage than that, use smartphones or tablets. But it's it's interesting, you know, we visit a lot of CPA firms during the course of a year, and I've actually been to CPA firms that are so antiquated that the managing partner doesn't even have a computer on his desk. So not everybody's up to speed, as you would think. So, but anyway, what that has done, what, what the cloud has done, uh, using tablets or smartphones, that's given to the rise of the virtual firm, meaning to, uh, a firm that exists solely online without the benefits uh, or w without the burden, as many may, may argue, of bricks and mortar. Uh, you can walk into your local Starbucks. You see people on their computers. Many of them are doing uh, financial work. Uh, so uh, many of them might be accountants. But today, about 15% of all new startup accounting or financial firms are virtual. And think about that for a while. You know, and, and, and 10 years ago, uh, how that was thought to almost to be impossible. Just a little look um, at public accounting by the numbers. The revenue, uh, the estimated revenue for the total public accounting now is almost $100 billion. And the number of firms residing in the U.S., this is domestic only, is about uh, just, just shy of 95,000. Now, I know many of you who belong to the AICPA and have heard many of their presentations or read many of their articles in the Journal of Accountancy, you know, they throw around a figure 45, 50,000 firms. But you have to remember that that figure is firms that are uh, members of the AICPA. And many, many, many firms in the country are not necessarily members of the AICPA. So the, uh, the figure is closer to 100,000 probably. And that includes everyone who basically hangs up a, a shingle in their basement to the big four. And the employment, you've got uh, just over half a million people in public accounting only. Uh, as far as growth, uh, still going at a pretty good clip. Not exactly matching the past couple of years where the figures were closer to 8 and 9%, but six and, almost 6.5%. Six and certainly folks will opt for that as far as gr overall growth. That's for the top 100 firms. And the growth in 2018 for firms, say $2 million and under, it's just about 7%, maybe just under that. So it's still going pretty strong as growth, but people are looking at, obviously, at different avenues uh, for growth. And M&A, &A, whether it's a traditional CPA firm or a non-traditional CPA firm, is, is certainly part of that. Let's look at what's keeping you folks awake at night. Uh, obviously, uh, attracting new clients, that's always at or near the top of, of uh, an accounting firm's concern list. Succession planning. It's just amazing how many firms, you know, that's one of our, obviously, our specialty. It's just amazing how many firms that we speak to during the course of a year that have absolutely no one on their bench and have absolutely no succession plan other than hopefully an upstream merger with a larger firm. Client fee pressure, uh, obviously, you know, since the recession, there's been a, a whole lot of emphasis on that, you know, uh, and firms are starting to feel it, differ differencing themselves from the competition. And here's where non-traditional mergers can certainly uh, come in, and we're going to look at, the, you know, at that a little bit later, uh, you know, establishing a point of difference from your competitor. So if you're if you order to, if you offer tax and bookkeeping and write up and the firm across the street offers the same thing if you offer a few more client uh, services that the maybe your competitor doesn't that's establishing your point of difference and that can only help you staffing recruiting and retention I don't think there's a week that goes by where myself or any of my colleagues here at Transition Advisors don't get a phone call from a from a CPA firm looking to hire a young CPA with or without a book of business. We always refer to that as the holy grail because few people ever attain it. 
I say, yeah, that's a great strategy, except 55,000 other firms in the country are pursuing the same strategy. New regulations and standards. We had the big uh, tax tax uh, cut law enacted last year. Uh, you see how that affected many of your clients. Technology, software investment. We're going to go into a little bit about the these pending technologies that I mentioned at the uh, onset of our presentation. Going paperless. You know, you know, it's it's hard to believe that the term paperless office was initially coined by Business Week magazine, uh, not in uh, not in 2000, not in the 90s, but in 1975. So that's how long the term paperless has been kicked around, uh, and you know, and and whatever people have different interpretations of it. I know some people claim to be paperless, but yet they have rows of file cabinets, but whatever going paperless, and then, of course, cybersecurity. And we're going to look at cybersecurity in great detail because that has so, sort of emerged as the number one far and away uh, requested non-traditional uh, service, non-traditional company by the CPA profession. And, of course, uh, next to it in the brackets, you see breaches. And, you know, every, anybody who reads, uh, you know, whether it's the consumer press or it's the trade press, you've known that many of the um, – with the big box retailers such as Home Depot and Target uh, or the credit bureau like Equifax or Anthem, the big health maintenance organization, they've all suffered data breaches. Uh, hackers come in, steal client information. So this is, this is a real, real problem. And that's why cybersecurity is in such demand. We're going to look at a few statistics about uh, cybersecurity in the accounting profession and how it's sort of a burgeoning. Uh, or I should say, probably more accurately, a snowballing, you know, phenomenon within the accounting profession. And it's not just tax returns anymore. And this all ties in to 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 non-traditional mergers. Future CPA firms are going to be become more consultative, and by by that, I mean they're going to be like more high-end consulting firms rather than just those. Um, offering commoditized services. They're going to be helping companies not just with, with and your clients, not just with financial reporting, but also, you know, consulting on improving margins, advising on industry trends, pending regulations that may affect their clients' businesses. And if you need pr proof, and this is why I bolded this on this slide, if you need proof of this, for those of you who live in uh, sort of urban areas, uh, I, I live in the greater New York area, so there's a lot of advertising for some of the larger firms, whether it's in a, a, a train, a, a commuter train, or a, a bus station, or, you know, in an in a office building, or, or whatever, you'll see the these billboard ads for some of the bigger firms. And if you read the advertising copy on many of these firms, look and see if they ever use the word accounting. They don't. They'll use words like professionals. They'll use words like advisors consultants, but they never use the word accounting. So that just sort of plays to this trend of this evolution of the CPA firm. Um, and then you're going to see how the technologies are going to affect this. So where in, you know, 15, 20 years, CPA firms will be basically will be high end consulting firms, many of them, maybe not perhaps some of the smaller ones where you have, you know, one or two people, but definitely some of the mid-market accounting firms are, go, are, are going that way and will continue to go that way. <laughs> Again, just to, to reiterate, there's been a surge in demand by our clients, our CPA firm clients, what can be termed non-traditional niches. Again, healthcare consulting, a huge one, obviously, with the, you know, with many of you who live in suburban areas, uh, who live on, you know, busy thoroughfares with a lot of strip malls or a lot of big box, you know, look and see how many office parks or parts of those strip malls are now those walk-in uh, walk clinics. So, you know, everything, a lot of, a lot of medical influence is, is, is happening. HR and payroll, family office, where you're basically the financial concierge, and the outsourced CFO services, which is going to be a $30 billion uh, client service by the end of, by 2020. However, uh, like I said, to, to reiterate, first and foremost are cybersecurity and IT consulting. So how do we know this? 
uh, about two months ago, we sent out a company survey. Nearly 80% of firms with revenue, annual revenue ranging anywhere from 7.5 million to roughly 300 million uh, targeted cybersecurity as the primary area for future strategic growth. Some other statistics you might be interested in regarding cybersecurity is experts predict by 2019, that's next year, there'll be a shortage of 2 million, 2 million cybersecurity professionals. Accounting is one of the fastest growing skills in cybersecurity job postings with, with an anticipated growth rate of 121% over the next five years. Let me repeat that for emphasis. An anticipated growth rate of 121%. And 89% of U.S. consumers believes it important for organizations to have cybersecurity certified employees on staff. And as you know, many of you who have clients who, uh, who are into that have probably seen that as well. Okay. I, w I mentioned the changing workforce demographic. Again, this will all play into it. Um, you know, baby boomers, you know, when they, you know, when they joined the workforce, the first ones born in 1946, if my memory serves, their concern was a pension. I mean, my dad got a pension. Uh, many of you probably had parents that had pensions. Many of you probably may have pensions. But now for the millennials, they want a purpose. They don't want a pension. They want a purpose. Your wish list. You know, I remember when I entered the workforce uh, back in the late 70s, you know, my, my, my wish list. Oh, I hope I have a great boss. Now for millennials, their wish list is to have great colleagues. You know, nine to five, that was the traditional work day. You know, nine to five or eight to five or nine to six, you know, but now it's whenever. Millennials, you know, they'll, with, with cloud applications, remote, a remote workforce, they can just, you know, if they want to start work at 11 o'clock at night, you know, they'll work through the night. They're not, they don't want to be constrained to an eight to six or eight to five work day. Again, the workplace, it was your office. You were tethered to your desk. I know I was. Uh, my father was, you know, and many of you were, but now it's wherever, you know, you feel like going to have a, a macchiato at Starbucks, you can still do work there because of, you know, you're working remotely, the cloud applications, you have your tablet, you have your laptop and your tenure, you know, your tenure, you know, people got the gold watch, nobody gets the gold watch anymore. It just doesn't happen. And, you know, millennials, eh, whatever, you know, if, if I decide to change jobs. You know, they're net, you got to people don't realize millennials are not going to stay forever. They just there's just too many options for them. So there's going to be a lot of churn uh, with millennials because, you know, like I said, there's just too many options available to them. So that sort of is the, you know, the workplace matrix of the 21st century, so to speak. So we can see, you know, you can see how the how, how that's changed. OK, we come to our second polling question of the afternoon. Your most likely personal succession plan looks like, one, finding an external buyer, two, selling internally to partners or staff, three, you have no idea, and that's fine too, because a lot of people have no idea. That's why we're here. We, we try to help them. Could we, the organizer, please open the polls, let our audience uh, take a few seconds to weigh in. Again, you have to answer at least one more after this to receive partial credit, just as a reminder. And just a couple more seconds. Let everybody. And please, uh, organizer, could you please close the polls and share the results with our audience? Okay, so everybody gets a look at that. You can see where you are in terms of succession with your colleagues who are listening today. Okay. All right. We had talked about uh, technology. Let's look at some of those. And I'm sure you've seen many articles that could explain in far greater detail than I have time allotted this afternoon. But, uh, you know, unless you're on another planet, you're probably uh, familiar with blockchain. And that was like, that sort of was as the foundation for Bit Bitcoin and allows instant verification of transaction without what they call a central authority. So basically, what you have are information in digital letter blocks. And they're reconciled uh, periodically. Uh, I have down here every 10 minutes or so. 
and they can't be altered. So uh, those far brighter minds than mine in technology say this is eventually going to revolutionize the audit process, uh, where it might be completely uh, as far automated in five to six years. Not only the audit process, but also tax preparation um, and, uh, and bookkeeping as well. Data entry, that type of thing, may all be automated. So what that's going to do, and you'll see a little later, is you know sort of prompt firms to start thinking about either reassigning folks uh, to different areas to prepare for this for this impending wave. And like I said, it's going to automate the what we call the Type A audit and tax work within five years, and alter the job responsibilities. Um, the Internet of Things (IoT) you've seen that by 2020. The internet will connect to over 50 billion devices, not just and obviously not just laptops, but washing machines, refrigerators, air conditioners. It's going to tell you when you need a new fuse or when you need a new water pump. Um, so 50 billion devices by the end of 2020 will be connected to the IoT. 3D printing. Now I don't know if, the, if any of you have ever seen this, but by 2018, nearly 30% of durable goods will use 3D printing. Um, my dentist 3D prints teeth, so that should give you um, one of the hot, one of the local uh, hospitals down in New York City has three has 3D printed a, a human heart. It's still five to ten years away from perfection, but think about that. They've printed a human heart. Uh, the global, uh, just as a sort of a, an update, the global market of three billion is will actually be 32 billion by the year 2023. So in five years, 3D printing is going to be a $32 billion global market. And 5G cellular, uh, the estimate, the ETA is supposed to be 2020, although AT&T has repeatedly said it promises to have 5G service by the end of this year. So those are some of the technologies that are going to come and impact accounting firms. A few more, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, it's currently getting to built in most financial software programs. People like uh, Sage and Intuit and Xero, names you're probably familiar with, either have it working now or, or have been in beta testing. Uh, essentially, the bot can be accessed via text or voice. It works like a mini Watson, the IBM computer inside a financial software program. It learns trends, preferences, and offers suggestions and changes. It integrates with an ERP system to automate the end-to-end -end accounting processes. Again, this is how it's revolutionizing the traditional paradigm of the CPA firm. And I'm sure, you know, if you go to accounting shows, there's going to be sessions on this. But I just wanted to give you, you know, a few slides without spending an inordinate amount of time on this, because I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. Okay, like I said, these encroaching technologies are going to force firms to pare down their focus on commoditized services and turn their strategic compass toward higher end advisory. So the predictions are for overall reductions of as much as 50% in the billable hours required to provide compliance-based services. Okay, again, they're gonna automate it, some figures five to seven, some four to six, but whatever, you folks get the idea. I'm not gonna delve down too far into this. Um, and again, it's gonna usher in a transformation of the accounting firm. So as lower level staff are replaced with technology, we're seeing that in today, even fast food, where counter people are being re replaced by robotics or self-serve. So it's it's encroaching on the accounting profession as well. All right, there are three ways to grow in this profession, and only three: one client at a time, or organic growth. But the economy, which is which is getting gaining steam, no doubt about it. But you know. They're still feeling the effects of 2008 when it was hitting rock bottom. And of course, increased competition has made organic growth a little harder to achieve. Still achievable, don't get me wrong, but it's just made it a little bit harder. Develop new marketable niches, which is sort of ties into what we're talking about today to a point, or merge or acquire another firm. So those are the three ways to grow. Let's look at reasons why firms merge. Geography, new markets. We're getting, over the past couple of years, we've been getting a lot of calls from firms, say, in the, in the uh, Northeast, whether it's New York or Boston um, or Philadelphia, 
you know, that they want to expand perhaps into Chicago or into Southeast Florida or even California. So they want, we're getting, you know, so expansion. If they find a firm that they like in a market they want, um, new niches, say, you know, business valuation, let's support. Uh, we'll look at, you know, the other ones I had mentioned at the outset of this program. Again, competition, you know, uh, to, to stave off competition. Lack of a formal succession plan. Uh, and look at this next one, which is why I highlighted in red. 75% of the AICPA's 400,000, excuse me, membership, and that's um, that's both the public and private sector for the AICPA, will be eligible to retire by 2020. 75% of the 400,000 people are going to be eligible to retire. One person turns 65 in the U.S. every eight seconds. So if we go the entire hour today, think about this. There are going to be 450 more 65th birthdays when we finish this afternoon. So you can see succession uh, is something to be taken seriously and, and not saying, oh, well, I got, you know, I want to work five to seven more years. That's exactly when you should start planning for succession or I want to work 10 more years. If you want to work 10 more years or, or seven more years, you should start planning now. Ideally, what I tell everyone, succession planning should start the day you open your firm for business, but rarely does it ever happen that way. So uh, the last thing you want to do is say, I want to work one more tax season and then get out, because then you're sort of pigeonholed yourself into an upstream merger with unfavorable terms, or if you can find somebody closing down your business, and that's certainly not the, uh, the scenario you want. So again, some of those are some of the reasons. And just to show you the changing landscape of the accounting profession, this was the 1997. This was the Accounting Today Top 100. I just listed some of the um, some of the firms that were in the top 20. Uh, Anderson, well, we all know what happened to them. Coopers and Librand, which is now part of PwC. If, those of you who remember the the roll-ups, uh, American Express Tax and Business Services, they were buying up firms at an incredible rate. You know, unfortunately, found out too late that financial planning and accounting aren't exactly run the same way, which is what we're going to get into a little later today how to value different businesses. They thought it would be all referrals, and they wound up retreating from the accounting uh, business, selling them back at probably pennies on the dollar. Uh, Baird, Kurtz, and Dobson, uh, now known as BKD, it's a far different firm. Constantine Associates. Um, and George S. Olive, which was a firm, I believe, in Indiana, if I'm if I remember correctly. So look at how many are not there anymore, or are part of something else. Why is activity so high uh, since 2011? Six to seven hundred publicly. Those are publicly announced mergers. You know, the the smaller ones. You know, the one and two person firms that decide to join. Those don't get reported in either the business press and certainly not the consumer press. Um, again, niche development, boomers, 78 million boomers exiting the workforce, the IT, new marketplaces, and the advantages of cross-selling. So you see, that's some of the reasons behind, you know, the activity. Okay, let's look at non-traditional merger frenzy. Between 2010 and 2014, four years, advisory services grew 91% among the top 100. Let me repeat that for emphasis, 91% advisory services, not your traditional accounting services. And if you look at the nation's largest firm, Deloitte, and of their $18.5 billion in U.S. revenues, not, uh, their, not including their overseas revenues, it generated in 2018, they're, they're on a, 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 a uh, fiscal year, I believe, some 49%, so almost half of that stemmed from its consulting services. And over the past three years, there have been 700 consulting firm acquisitions, not necessarily CPA firm, or non-traditional mergers with about 20% of that figure facilitated by the big four firms. Again, um, as I tell our traditional uh, M&A sessions, you know, the four C's, people... And it's really no, it's really no different uh, with a non-traditional company as it is with a traditional CPA firm. You still have to have what we call the four C's. You have to have chemistry between the two parties. 
And basically, if you don't want to have lunch with somebody, don't do a deal with them. Because if you're not comfortable with them, why on earth would any of your clients or staff be? Continuity. How long have the clients, whether it's a traditional CPA firm or non-traditional firm, been clients? You know, how long have the partners been partners or the owners? Is there a lot of staff turnover? You know, a culture. What's it like to work here? What's it like to be a partner here? And perhaps most importantly is, you know, what's it like to be a client here? Capacity. Does the successor firm have the capacity to take you on, replace the roles? Or in your case, if you're looking at a non-traditional firm, do you have the capacity to take to take uh, a non-traditional firm on? Do you want them to stay on? Do you have the knowledge to keep it on? And we're going to look at that as well. We come to our third polling question of the afternoon. How many partners in your firm will likely slow down over the next five years? We have four choices. None, which probably would be ideal for a lot of folks. Two, all of them, which would be the worst case scenario uh, if you don't have a succession plan. Three, most of them, or four, some of them. And can I ask the organizer to open up the polls and keep it open for a few seconds, let our audience today weigh in, and then at the end we'll share it with everybody? Okay, a couple more seconds, let everybody get a chance. Okay, can I ask the organizer to close the polls and share the results with our audience? Okay. So everybody got a chance to look at it. Again, you have to answer at least three questions to get partial CPE credit and four of them to get the full, as, as well as complete the online evaluation. Okay, let's move on. Finding the right fit, and this is, you know, I know it's a little wordy here. It's not always the proverbial round peg in the round hole, okay? It has to make sense, whether it's a traditional CPA firm or non-traditional. It's got to make sense for both the buyer and the seller. And what I mean by that is if, if um, a financial planning, financial planning firm specializing in high net worth individual and trust work it will not make a good merger partner to a firm that pumps out $300 tax returns. It's just not going to happen. The, um, the, the, it just doesn't mesh. There's no, there's no chemistry there. There's no continuity there. Um, and that also applies uh, for a firm that may not have made the transition to a paperless culture and was courting an IT practice specializing in sophisticated services, such as financial stress tests or service organizational control audits. That's not going to, that's not going to fly. First of all, I don't think the non-traditional company would go with you would, would go with a company or a, a firm like that. Or conversely, on the on a positive side, an engineering or a construction firm might appeal to a practice that has a thriving uh, client service and cost segregation. That might make an ideal fit. Again, it, you know, you have to, you know, it does a, you need a lot of due diligence. Uh, what are the most in demand? non-traditional merger partners. Again, cybersecurity, and I can't stress this enough. If you take anything away from today, know, know this, cybersecurity is first and foremost the hottest client service niche. Um, just last year, we recently helped uh, a top 100 firm in the Mid-Atlantic merge in a small cybersecurity practice in New England that was under a million dollars in revenue. Now, normally, they would not have looked at a traditional CPA firm in an area where they didn't have a footprint that was under 10 million. It just wouldn't make sense for them. Um, it would be, you know, it would not be a good return on their investment. However, because uh, cybersecurity is largely done uh, through the cloud and online, uh, it didn't really, geography was really secondary. Uh, so it, it, was, it was less important. But anyway, it was under a million and we, we did that. Human resources, uh, IT consulting separate from cybersecurity, installation and maintenance, that type of thing, uh, payroll, marketing, health care, you know, because of the Affordable Care Act, that still hasn't lost its importance. And engineering, again, for those firms uh, who offer cost segregation, that might make a nice fit in there. Okay. And here's the questions you have to ask, regardless of the niche you're, you're looking at, whether it's cybersecurity or uh, cost segregation or what. Is is it underserved in your practice area? Uh, you know, is it a good niche for the firm with growth potential? I mean, do you have any existing clients in that niche? So, you know, if, if 
you don't have, say, anybody in you know construction or anything like that, you know, cost segregation probably would not be something. Or if uh, you know your clients are mostly four hundred dollar tax returns, cybersecurity probably isn't something that you would would want to make the investment in. Um, who's going to be the champion, you know, in your firm? Is somebody going to lead that division, uh, lead the non traditional? And you and you have that all important partner buy in because if you have four partners and three of them want to do it and one doesn't, it's going to make life very difficult. Um, and how do you market these new services to existing and new clients? You have a you have a marketing plan. You have a strategy to do that. These are some of the preliminary questions you have to ask before examining a non-traditional merger. And as far as um, due diligence, again, three criti critical questions you need to answer. How well is your firm aligned with the niche? What are the current trends in that industry niche? You know, and that's easy to find out. You can read um, every every industry or non-traditional. Uh, uh, industry that I've spoken about or field has their own uh, business press. You know, cybersecurity. There's a ton of articles or a ton of journals on that. You know, as in as is their HR, as is their you know engineering or payroll. There's there's just uh, there's just a, a, a voluminous amount of reading material, and you you know you're best to to catch up on that. And how well is that niche doing? You know, currently over the past three years. Um, and then the research call. Now the research call. It would be, you know, you would say contact somebody who's into cybersecurity, not as a business proposition. Just say, look, I'm researching this for a possible acquisition. And trust me, the um, uh, the heads of companies, the CEO of companies are very happy to talk about how well they've done or uh, what's going on. You know, as long as you, you, you're not saying, oh, I'm calling because I want you to merge with me. Make it make it understood from the outset that this is not a, you know, a sales call. You're just doing some research. Um, you're looking at this, you know, you're you're looking, you know, you've targeted some firms and I just, you just wanted to get some perspective and trust me, they'll be happy to talk to you. So those are, you know, those are some of the things that you can do as far as due diligence. And some of the advantages of non-traditional mergers, all right, it forges a competitive point of difference. It positions your firm as experts in what you, <laughs> what I don't need to tell you is a very, very crowded marketplace. Increases client focus and needs. Can you help them with a problem? You know, and specialty firms obviously can get more specific than generalist practices. Um, not too long ago, maybe five, six years ago, the AICPA came out with a survey that showed, uh, and it uh, centered around client retention. And it showed, you know, how exponentially your client retention rate increased. Uh, with the amount of client services you offer. So if you have a client that just does, you know, that you do a tax return for, you know, you, your chance, your, your, you have a, a greater chance of losing that client um, to a competitor than you would if that same client, uh, if you do some financial planning for them, if you do some other kind of consulting for them, if you offer them three or four services, they're much less likely to leave which is one of the advantages of these non-traditional companies. Key steps in a deal, organize your must-haves. This is, you know, for non-traditional as well as traditional. Identify what your merger partner should look like. You know, you have your, addition, your initial meetings, narrow the field and share non-binding offers, perform your due diligence and then close the deal. That's, that's sort of an oversimplification of the process, but you, but you get the idea. Um, some examples of some non-traditional mergers, some real life Berry Dunn, a firm up in Maine, uh, combined with a, a healthcare consulting firm, provides guidance on healthcare finance and policy. Sickich, Chicago area firm. This is one of the, the first firms in the country to go in, into the non-traditional arena. Um, started many, many years ago uh, under its founder and then uh, just started adding you know, non-traditional companies expanded its employee benefit services. They acquired uh, a Milwaukee-based company that does that. LBMC, a very good firm down in Tennessee. They acquired something called W Square. They're an outsourcing company, offers finance, payroll, HR, and technology. Witham, Smith & Brown, a big regional firm up here in the uh, tri-state area. They merged in an IT consulting firm, Portal Solutions, uh, expanding its offering of digital services. Uh, just a few more, not to spend all this time on it, CBiz, um, 
acquired a consulting firm that helps them with outsourced services, auditing and preparing for IPOs. Uh, ID Bailey, which is a very uh, progressive technology firm, acquired Spring Two Technologies. Um, they're a consulting firm. They specialize in the NetSuite uh, publishing software and Decipher Forensics, a data recovery company. Crow Horwath uh, merged in uh, Government Risk Compliance Unit. And Marks Nelson acquired Blue Ocean Consulting, a company that provides digital services as well as custom software. So you can see these are all examples of uh, recent examples of some non-traditional, some of the bigger firms that have done non-traditional. Of course, uh, some of the smaller firms uh, have done it as well, but these are some that you might be familiar with. Okay, structuring. Um, this can get a little complicated. Accounting firms are valued similarly. Everybody always asks us, what's the multiple? What's the multiple? What's the multiple? And I always tell them that the that uh, accounting firms are valued similarly because they're often structured and operate the same way. They may offer, they may be uh, different size, they may offer different services, but they operate basically the same way. But not so f for consulting companies. Um, consulting firms, for example, can ha have a higher staff leverage, sometimes 40 to 50 employees per owner. And it also depends on the uh, specific type of firm. And the questions, are you buying the entity outright? If so, you must come with an agreed upon sales price. Are you merging the new entity into your core accounting firm? Then much like a CPA firm merger, your owner's agreement will likely dictate the value. Are you setting up the non-traditional concern as a separate entity? If so, you'll need to draft a separate owner agreement with the consulting firm principles. For example, uh, if you have a consulting firm, and it doesn't matter what field it is, if it's if it's generating $2 million in revenue prior to the merger, a new owner agreement may stipulate that the first $2 million generated goes 100% to the consulting entity because you can't ask them to merge and make less money. Um, nobody's going to do that. And then anything above that, now that they are using your resources and your clients as cross-selling opportunities, but anything above the $2 million is shared evenly between the CPA firm and the consulting company. So that's always sort of a nice compromise for everyone. Okay, we come to our final polling question of the afternoon. And as does your firm have adequate talent on the bench to replace retiring partners? And one, pretty simple, no, we don't. Two, uh, I think so, but we're not sure how to admit them. Three, yes, we're confident our approach works. And four, we aren't planning internal succession. And can I ask the organizer to open up the polls for our audience? And we're going to let it go for a couple of seconds. Let everybody weigh in. The final one, if you answered all four and you answered the evaluation, you'll receive your certificate. A couple more seconds. Okay. And I think everybody's had a chance. Okay, can I ask the uh, organizer close the polls and show the uh, results to our audience? Okay. Everybody gets a good look at that. Okay, valuations. Valuations of accounting firms have been dropping steadily over the past 10 years. For those of you in the M&A market, you know that. Where firms in larger markets such as New York, Chicago, or L.A. could get as high as one and a half, now the norm is probably closer to one-time revenue. Wealth management companies tend to be valued a little higher, two to three times fees range. Payroll companies usually lie in one and a half. Software and IT companies command the highest multiples. Um, can be anywhere from three times to seven times. In fact, their recent software acquisition, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of our presentation, went for 15 times revenue. 15 times. So again, it all depends on what area you're looking at. Some roadblocks, time, and we like to say time kills all deals. You know, uh, capacity, again, uh, the messages you send, you know, as far as taking too much time, A, that, that, that your merger candidate is not a priority, or B, you're so busy, they're going to wonder if you have time to spend with them or, or to, to, to pay attention. Um, Again, you know, time, you you risk the chance of leaking the news or the le news leaks out to, to the marketplace, to clients and staff. And, of course, that's going to uh, cause a, a bit of a panic. 
you know, the 13th time you read an agreement, you may find something. Uh, and then you also, one of the um, disadvantages of that is, uh, of time, is you open the door to your competition. If they find out about it, they may just suddenly join in, in, in the fray. So, today's takeaways. Uh, like traditional mergers, don't merge because everyone else is doing it, and that includes non-traditional mergers as well. Determine your client needs and act accordingly. The niche has to make sense for you and your clients. A firm, again, a firm that's not paperless should not consider a technology firm, but that's sort of basic common sense. Nor, non-traditional deals are valued and structured differently from the traditional CPA firm merger. It's also going to be determined by the niche. And like any traditional merger, you must get unity and uh, and, and buy it. Okay, so, and for more information, as I mentioned, uh, there's my um, uh, contact information, my email, if anybody has any questions. I think we have uh, one or two minutes. You know, I can take one or two questions. Uh, and we do have s some questions are pouring in. Um, and we have, okay, and we have some, one from John. And John has a question. He says, my company is currently looking at acquiring a medical consulting practice, which we feel will expand our current healthcare unit. However, the negotiations are stalled on the multiple. They're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of three times. Does that sound right? Well, welcome to the M&A world, John. That's an <laughs> getting stalled on the multiple is, is, a, is a common problem. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that one has multiple scenarios and answers. As I said during the broadcast, different businesses are valued differently. Accounting firms are valued similarly because they operate the same way. But a medical consulting practice obviously operates a bit differently. Um, for you know, uh, like like in most traditional mergers, uh, the multiples are the effect. There are other variables that are cost. For instance, are you giving is your firm giving any cash up front? Are you acquiring it outright, or will the principles of the seller business remain? And what type of healthcare consulting practice? Does it dovetail with what you're currently doing, I guess? Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. Bottom line is, and this is, you know, this is basically, again, common sense. If you think that it's too high a multiple to pay versus any potential returns you see down the road, then guess what? It probably is. Um, okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question. And this is, um, Sue is, uh, Sue is on. And she says, our firm offers cost segregation services, and we're shopping around for an engineering firm. Wow. That ties right into what we're talking about today. We've spoken to a few companies, but some have told us that if the owners are not made partners of the CPA firm, then there's no deal. Sue, this is a lot more common than you think. It's always tough to reconcile making someone a partner, for example, if you're dealing with a $60 million accounting firm, uh, to one whose business may be bringing in $2 million or less, and they're not contributing to the core firm's book of business. Uh, again, that's a big problem even in traditional mergers. But there's, there are ways around that. For example, you can hold them out as a partner but make them income partners with no governance or an ownership stake. Or you can draft what we call a path to ownership where you set revenue targets and goals for them to reach at specified times in order for them to get on that partner track. Um, so, uh, okay. So um, any I'm looking for any more questions. And if nobody has any more questions. Uh, oh, there's one more. Okay. Brad. Brad is next up. Uh, we're currently a VAR. Uh, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the acronym VAR, that stands for Value Added Reseller. Um, we're a VAR for a major software publisher, but are looking to add cybersecurity. Any suggestions? Well, Brad, perhaps you and a thousand other firms in the country are searching for the same thing. As I stated many times during this hour, cybersecurity is far and away the most sought-after non-traditional niche. And I don't want to scare you, but you're going to be up against some stiff competition as nearly, probably nearly all the top uh, 100 and regional firms are open to acquiring cybersecurity uh, folks and, and companies. My suggestion is to start small. Google cybersecurity, but, fi but filters on your local ge geographic area to begin with. Then you'll probably have a, at least a chance of opening up a dialogue with a smaller firm who may be intimidated by the size of a regional or super regional practice and may feel more comfortable with you. So um, hopefully that, that helps. And thanks, thanks for the folks who uh, sent in those questions. And any more, again, take down my email address. Uh, and we encourage you to go to our website for further resources. 
um, and want to thank you folks for spending uh, an hour with us today. Hopefully it was informative, um, and hopefully we'll see you at one of the upcoming webinars uh, that we advertised uh, in the beginning of the presentation. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone.